I would like to welcome Kabwani Kiwanga. I'm very grateful to you that you have accepted to do this talk for our audience. Uh, you are the 15th winner of the Zurich Art Prize, so congratulations on that one. When we talked before about how we are going to do this conversation, we have agreed on that you don't want to have this very classical artist conversation with a camera directed onto mm. your face. Maybe you just give us your reflection on why you prefer that. I think the artwork speaks for itself. It's not, uh, it's not autobiographical. My work is not autobiographical. It's more of a reflection on the world around us. Uh, sometimes even uh, parts of the world or cultures that I, I'm not particularly um, uh, an insider. Uh, so I would like the work to, to be the thing that speaks. And I don't mind giving some, uh, some information about how I came to, to choosing or how I work, but it's, it's, it's not autobiographical. You studied anthropology and uh, comparative religion science. And then you sort of have also worked as a freelance filmmaker, which I found very interesting. And I've, I read somewhere the quote that also already as a filmmaker, you had the feeling that all the stories are never told in an entity. You can never tell all the stories. And was this period of filmmaking, the studies, I think they all come into your artwork today. Yeah, I think so. I think... Uh as with any person, uh, you're an accumulation of your experiences, whether that be uh, where you lived or what you ate as a, a child, whatever. And I, of course, the, my formation uh, in uh, anthropology and comparative religion also included uh, that. But it's more of a question of looking at the world and asking questions, very simply. Mm -hmm. uh, and those two domains were different ways of, of asking those that simple question. Where are we? How did we get here? Who are we? Mm -hmm. Very simple. Do you see art as answers giving or is it rather posing more questions? Yeah, I think, yeah, maybe posing more questions or proposals of uh, ways to move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, so questions, but also proposing, yeah, new models maybe uh, that we can try out or exercises. Um, and I think what's interesting with what I've seen in art is that at least you can work with different languages. You can work with uh, different intelligences. So the material intelligence or spatial or temporal, it doesn't have to simply be conceptual, intellectual, academic. Um, and you can have that open to people, but it allows for, I think, I hope, um, a more diverse audience that can relate from different entry points. And so that's what I hope to do. And I guess there's some works which are more successful than others. And it's in the end, it's the, the public who decides if it's successful for them. For the exhibition at the Museum House Constructive, you have developed a new piece, which mm -hmm. I'm very happy to have here at the museum. And it's a piece which uh, is clearly done according to the possibilities of the space. It's also the biggest floor relief piece you have done so far. Mm -hmm. You have given it the title, Worlds We Tell, double point, threshold. So yeah, I think the threshold for me, I mean, the worlds we tell is part of a larger series, but as you mentioned, this is the, the largest, I mean, in terms of a footprint uh, in the series. And for me, threshold also really relates to the specific cosmogony, um, which comes from the Congo, uh, Congo cultural group, not the Congo country. It's mm -hmm. important to, to think beyond boundaries in this case, because we're talking about uh, yeah, ways of thinking about the world. And the idea of that there's a threshold, so multiple worlds, worlds which exist together. So there's a threshold or a moment or a point of contact in which different worlds interact. Um, and so in this case, it's the spiritual world and then the, the human or the physical world, which are seen uh, as really uh, interacting and um, having a communication. So that threshold is the space in which um, the interaction happens. But I think that uh, it could be a, a larger... Uh, way of looking at how different parallel worlds are existing within our, it could be in Zurich, it could be uh, in Paris where, where I've lived, the, the different uh, moments or where these points of contact where the worlds can, can connect and interact. And with these questions of uh, telling the world, it's also thinking about the stories we've been told, 
uh, the cultural maybe worldview that we've been we've grown up in will really I think form and uh, sculpt how we relate to one another, how we relate to our environment, how we relate to a built environment, how we build our societies, mm. and those. Worlds can be, you know, brought around in different minds that are circulating in the same geographic space, um, but sometimes have a point of contact. Sometimes that's conflicts. Sometimes it's a point of dialogue. But that I think we have to keep in mind that uh, we're all carrying around different worldviews, um, mm. and so the threshold is that point of, I guess, interaction or of, of um, yeah, of contact. When you say cosmogony, you are referring to one image of a cosmogony. This image actually contains four pillars. And you have sort of translated this image here with four steel tubes. Mm -hmm. And you have cho chosen ficus wood. In many uh, worldviews or cultures, there's this idea of a primordial tree or the first tree. Uh, and so in this case, it's similar. Uh, and it's the ficus, the ficus uh, tree. And then you chose the board in purple. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the border itself, um, the color, this kind of deep purple, I've used in other work as well. And for me, it, it somehow signifies in my own uh, thought um, night without it being uh, black. And f when you think about you know a world which is created within a universe, it could in some way be space if one wants to, although I didn't go to black. Um, so for me, that was the kind of the, uh, the, the the choice of this particular color, and it was this idea of, of course, framing another uh, image in the in the center. And the, the question of like day and night is is kind of also this, you know, referring back to the the human world and then the spirit world. Um, and you could choose whatever color you want to associate. But what is also interesting is that it, um, you know, we spoke about no top or no bottom, and in my Installations generally the question of multiple perspectives um, because perspective should always be changing. There isn't one perspective. There's multiple ways uh, in which one can apprehend the world, and so the fact that you know a lot of times we think about worldviews or environments or universes as circular or oval. Uh, in this case, uh, it's very rectiline. It's a rectangle. Mm -hmm. There's straight lines which have some, you know, um, spherical or or orb-like or, or rounded. Um, uh, Aspects, but one can also think about uh, mathematics, I guess, and, and projecting of what's a 2D, what's a 3D uh, world. And if one imagines this being a flattened universe, you can also think about if you could project, it could be uh, turned or folded into one another and become a sphere. Mm -hmm. So I think it's also about what our perception is, uh, what one sees and what doesn't see, uh, and what our, our limitations are in terms of vision or representation. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm not a mathematician, but I think the, the, the ways of thinking about different dimensions, third, fourth, fifth dimension, um, in a very, uh, in terms of perception, is, is also an interesting way of uh, thinking about our, our learned uh, cosmogonies or ways of understanding the world or envisioning the world. Because in the end, I guess the cosmogonies are simply a way of us trying to find some order um, within the world around us. It's creating some structure out of the raw material of life. And so these raw materials I have myself uh, assembled um, in a way that responds to what I had read about the, the Congo cosmogony. Mm -hmm. We have another work here, the exhibition, mm -hmm. which tells a lot about mm -hmm people's bodies controlled by architecture. So I suggest we go and see this one. Yep. This two-tone wall recalls another. One encountered at the historic prison of saint Laurent de Marigny in French Vienna. Tourist guides point to the black charcoal paint on the bottom, which lays below an upper band of coral pink. The black colouring was said to easily come off if leaned against, and was thus used to curb disorderly behaviour. Here in this space we are showing a selection of the so-called linear paintings. We see that they have the same size, that they all have two colours, but they are united by one specific thing, which is the height. Yeah, so these two-tone paintings are basically uh, split 
or hung, the, the transition between the two colors is hung at 160 centimeters from the ground. And that reference comes from a, a suggestion that was made in 1905 during a, a conference around tuberculosis that was held in Paris, France. And uh, that in that conference, uh, architects had suggested that um, to fight against tuberculosis and other transmission of diseases, as there was a big influx of people from countryside into urban areas, uh, to, to paint um, uh, washable paint uh, at the height of 160 uh, centimeters to be able to, you know, to clean off uh, what would be bacteria or viral uh, uh, spores. Um, and so that 160 also, of course, is more from your background in art uh, and art history and curating, uh, is also one of these lines which is often hung as the eye line um, for, for some, depending on uh, your, your background of the mm -hmm of a, a site to hang. But the reference really is from this 1905 um, conference on tuberculosis. And then a second referential point for these paintings are the colors itself. Mm -hmm. So you, you have been talking about a scientific research. So this is more of a color theorist. So this is uh, yeah. Faber Biren. And so he um, you know, developed a whole color theory about how you know, the colors will affect workers' productivity, um, people's moods, and different uh, uh, color schemes. And so this one, I, as I understand, is most idea of kind of pe keeping people alert, um, you know, in the, with heavier machinery. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have, you know, different examples from different parts of the world, different times as well. Uh, you know, I think from a psychiatric hospital in, in Canada to, you know, a Chicago printing uh, factory, French Guiana um, penal colony or penal uh, prison, uh, and then you know, U.S. Coast Guard office colors. So it's really a mix: school, uh, hospitals, and it's really what's important to also note is that these these paintings are done on drywall, um, mm -hmm. which is of course one of the most the, the one of the last kind of I guess skins of a building apart from the painting. So it's almost imagining that the um, we've taken uh, a sample out of this space and brought it into another space. So kind of conflating uh, different geographic and, and temporal places uh, into into this uh, this one uh, room. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this amazing exhibition and for your contribution. Thanks very much, Kapani. Thank you. Thank you to all the team for doing a great job. Thank you.